The most anticipated game of the season is right around the corner as the Texas Longhorns travel to Tuscaloosa to take on the Alabama Crimson Tide. Why is Alabama looking to return to their old style of play? Which new names should we watch out for? And most importantly, what does Texas need to do to leave Bryant-Denny Stadium with the win? After the video, make sure to go to Inside Texas to stay locked in with your favorite team. Practice and post-game reports, behind-the-scenes info on the team, and always intelligent analysis. Subscribe to InsideTexas.com today. Link in the description. Texas is coming into a year with a lot of consistency on both sides of the ball. Alabama is bringing a renewed emphasis on getting back to their old ways of domination. Who has the upper hand? Without further ado, let's get into it. Bama's in an interesting spot. Saban let both coordinators go their own way, and the offseason has been all about returning to a more physical style of football, one more focused on a grinding, consistent run game and not relying solely on the magic of Bryce Young. Though it wasn't the hottest name on the market, Saban's Tommy Reese hire is a schematic fit for this style of ball. A heavy personnel-focused run scheme with simplified underneath pass concepts with the ability to take the play-action shot over the top when the time is right. Most importantly, Reese allows the quarterback to make plays with their legs, both in the designed run and off-script plays. It's not the sexiest offense, but it does match the Alabama personnel and leverages the team's strengths. First, let's hit the quarterback room. And it's been a close race, but expectedly Milrow got the start versus Middle Tennessee. And Milrow did exactly what was asked of him in Game 1. He made a lot of progress from that frantic, mistake-filled a and performance last season. He completed the easy reads underneath to keep the offense moving early in their 12 personnel looks. And later in the game, he found success in their spread looks, completing several deep balls on the money when the receiver won their matchup. The one thing missing from the tape is displaying that true command of the 1-2-3 pure progression dropback game. Milrow can absolutely lock on to one receiver, and if he beats his man, deliver the deep strike. But what if that's not open? Can you get to that number two read in the middle of the field when there's traffic? It's not a complex style of play, but you don't need all that. You need a reliable quarterback that keeps the team moving forward and doesn't force the bad ball. And Milrow did that. When the defense cheated up or got mismatched, he made them pay over the top. And that's what Saban wants. The big question with Milrow were more about his passing acumen. One thing we've never had to question is his athleticism. When evaluating Milrow, the first thing that's going to strike you is his incredible running ability. That was displayed once again versus Middle Tennessee on broken plays and designed runs. He's a blur when he takes off, and it's incredible to be that explosive at that size. Milrow can turn a bad play or a key third down into a soul-crushing, deflating conversion with his legs. It's hard on defenses mentally to do everything right, and he still goes for 40. But yes, ultimately Milrow isn't the caliber of passer Bryce was. Very few are. But a more measured approach on offense will make them less explosive overall, but they're more likely to connect plays for longer drives and control the clock, achieving that balanced style Saban has been asking for. But to achieve this play style, there's one core group it all hinges on. The success of the Bama offensive line. Alabama's starting left tackle headed to the NFL, and a talented true freshman won the job. Caden Proctor was the top tackle in the 2023 class, with an absurd mix of athletic ability and a 6'7", 360-pound frame. He has first-round tangibles, but he wasn't tested at the highest level of high school ball, like a Texas, Florida, or California coming from the small state of Iowa. It's a big jump to the big leagues of Power 5, but talent is talent. He's a player to watch for in the draft three years from now. True sophomore Tyler Booker got the start at left guard. He's another hulking player at 6'5", 352 pounds. He did get 427 snaps as a true freshman last season, but his run blocking grade was poor, ranking 43rd of 64 run blocking offensive linemen if added to the Big 12. The Bama offensive line then has some much needed maturity in senior Seth McLaughlin. He's played a total of 1,041 snaps at the center position, and he's done well, ranking 12th of 64 run blockers. After a battle at the other guard spot, Darian Dalcourt won out, getting the start at right guard. He's small relative to the others at 6'3", 320 pounds, and Saban tried him out at center last year before ultimately benching him. 
but he did do well in his limited 300 snaps last year as the highest graded Alabama run blocker on the line, holding down that number four spot. As a fifth year player, he adds some steadiness and push to a fairly young group overall. And finally, at right tackle, you have the six foot six, 360 pound JC Latham in his junior campaign. He'll be off to the NFL following this season. He's also a solid run blocker, ranking 13th of 64 run blocking offensive linemen if added to the Big 12. There's a good mix of inexperienced but athletically gifted talent paired with some less freaky but stable veterans. It is a new configuration overall, so it'll take some time to gel, especially early on. But luckily, they're blocking for the deepest room on the offense, the running backs. Let's take a look at the oldest members of the room who had to sit behind Gibbs last season. First, we have senior Jace McClellan. The 5'11", 212-pound back put up 650 yards and a third-best 5.9 yards per carry with seven touchdowns last season. As Texas saw in our last matchup, he's got a solid breakaway percentage too, able to make the long run on 34% of his touches. But overall, he's ranked 7th of 18 Big 12 running backs. Then you've got the other senior in Roydale Williams, who put up a mid-level 4.6 yards per carry on 55 attempts last year. The 5'10", 214-pound back is best in goal line or short yardage situations. Then you have the younger guys Alabama can cycle through if needed. The one I'm most excited for is former Texas commit Jam Miller. The 5'10", 211-pound sophomore flashed later in the year. As a freshman, he gained 223 yards on just 33 attempts, averaging an impressive 6.8 yards per carry. He's got a dynamic mix of power and speed, and I think he has the best overall traits in the room. But I would be remiss not to mention true freshman five-star Justice Haynes. He showed out in the spring game, and he'll be the long-term future of the room, and he'll absolutely get meaningful reps as the season wears on. At 5'11", 205, he's already tough to take down, and he can move the pile while also being able to break that big run. He's a good match for the tough running style Saban wants in the coming years. But for this offensive style, there's another key component, and that's the diverse group of tight ends. The tight end room is interesting for a couple reasons. Last year, Reese had Mayer at Notre Dame, a dominant assignment sound tight end that had 101 targets and nine touchdowns, and he got drafted in the second round. He was the best graded tight end in all of Power 5. The tight end is an important part of Reese's game plan in the run, but he also utilizes them very effectively in the pass. First, you have the most intriguing athlete in the room and true sophomore Amari Nyblak. Standing at 6'4", 233 pounds is just a sophomore. His movement skills are so good, he could even be a big outside receiver in other offenses. And you saw how he got split out often versus Middle Tennessee. He can catch the touchdown over the top, but he has to display more consistency in blocking assignments complementing the line to fully maximize. But he did have the most snaps of any tight end in the first game. Second in snaps was transfer CJ Dupree, who Saban went and plucked from Maryland in the offseason. He's 6'5", 257 pounds, and has that similar build to Mayer at Notre Dame. He caught 30 balls for three touchdowns last season, and he's someone to watch. He's a decent overall blocker, ranking 21st of 50 tight end blockers in his first game. Third in snaps is more your pure H-back, fullback style blocker in the 6'4", 258-pound Robbie Oots. The junior can get you those tough yards lead blocking, and he's a good counter to the more receiving-focused tight ends and 12 personnel. And finally, fourth in game one snaps is redshirt freshman Danny Lewis. But even though he had the least snaps, he's actually the one to watch at 6'5", 255 pounds. And he has that good balance between handling his blocks and slipping out into the pass game. He's young, but Bama likes him a lot. So you can see this is a versatile group of tight end talent that perfectly complements Reese's strength and 12 personnel, able to blend run-heavy concepts while still allowing for the threat of the pass. But how was Alabama's pass game last season? It was solid, averaging 9.4 yards per attempt for 13th in the nation. But even with Bryce at quarterback, it couldn't crack the top five. The pass blocking did improve considerably from the previous year, though. 
If added to the Big 12 last season, Alabama was the best pass-blocking team in offensive line pass-blocking efficiency while only allowing 74 total pressures. Left guard Tyler Booker ranks second if added to the Big 12. Right tackle J.C. Latham is third. Center Seth McLaughlin is 13th. And left guard Darian Dalcourt is 14th of 50 pass-blocking offensive linemen. But of course, it's a new year, so we still have to see how they hold up in this new configuration against Power 5 talent. They did have a couple issues versus Middle Tennessee's aggressive pass rush. So you're probably wondering, why did I wait to feature the wide receivers last? Two reasons. Bama will be in 12 personnel more often, so naturally there's going to be less receivers on the field. And second is due to their struggles last year making key plays with lack of separation and drops. But let's see the dudes who can get it back on track. The depth chart has the typical X and Z as outside receivers and H as their slot. But it's not rigid in how they line up. They can switch up inside or outside based on key situations. First in targets last season is outside X receiver Ja'Cory Brooks, but he was held out of the first half on Saturday. He's a lanky strider with an impressive 17.3 yards per reception, but he can be used all over the field. He's tied with Xavier Worthy for first in the league with eight touchdowns, but Worthy has almost 50 more targets, so Brooks is far more efficient. Even though he does have some drop issues, ranking fourth in the league with eight. He's Alabama's most utilized receiver in that intermediate range of 10 to 19 yards. He does a good job of wrapping behind underneath coverage and sitting down in zones. Brooks is Bama's second most utilized deep threat as well. And on top of that, he can be used in the short game on screens. He's that all-purpose, talented, taller athlete, but he's most dangerous in the middle of the field. Overall, he ranks third if added to the Big 12. But he does appear to have a worthy challenger and transfer Malik Benson. Alabama added the number one Juco prospect in the nation and receiver Malik Benson. He's a talented guy, 10.4400 meters, so he's fast, but on top of the speed, he's an adept route runner. He's got positional flexibility at 6 foot 1, 195 pounds, but he's currently in an and or situation with X receiver Brooks. It'll be a big jump from Juco to Power 5, but the ability translates easier through the ranks as a wide receiver because weight and physicality aren't as key as with an offensive lineman, for example. Second in targets last year is the opposite outside Z receiver in Jermaine Burton. He had 58 targets, pulling in 40 of those for 7 touchdowns. He's second on the team in yards per catch at 16.9. He's the most targeted deep threat with 16 shots, but he only pulled in 7. Overall, he ranks 5th if added to the Big 12. Next, we have a logjam of slot body types. Alabama has a talented room, but their most explosive guys are pretty similar in skill set. The ones that don't win out in slot can be moved around to supplement the two deep at the other outside spots. First, let's talk about starting slot Isaiah Bond. He caught 5 balls for 76 yards and a touchdown on Saturday. He's also an elite speedster, winning the Georgia 6A 100-meter and 200-meter championship in high school. Bond is a problem in the slot, whether he's dovetailing out for a screen or testing you vertically on the slot fade. He still needs to turn that raw ability into a more polished product, but he did catch 17 balls for one touchdown last season. But this year should be his coming out party. Then Bama has another merchant of speed in Kendrick Law. He had a 10.48 personal best in the 5A Louisiana State track meet. He's a short guy at 5'11", but he does have some good weight at 201 pounds. He's shown a good ability to sit down in zone or stair-step his route to create some separation in man. Right now, he's backing up Burton at Z. And then finally, we have Kobe Prentice, and he was getting a lot of buzz out of camp last season, but the hype has seemed to die down just a little bit. He held the third most targets for Bama last season at 41, catching 31 balls for 10.9 yards per catch and two touchdowns, and he even got four targets in their opener in that backup slot role. Alabama is an interesting group this year. Can they enact their game plan of tough running heavy personnel with a first-year starting quarterback while remaining explosive over the top with a talented core of wide receivers? We're going to have to wait and see. But the keys for the Texas defense relies on our defensive line's ability versus Alabama's renewed run and aggression focus. They have NFL players on their O-line and we have NFL players on our D-line. And Bama's new emphasis on 12 personnel is actually nothing new in the Big 12. 
Actually, last year, our defense did better against heavy personnel. It was the spread tempo teams that gave us more problems. We do have a new starting will in David Benda and Edge and Ethan Burke. Alabama is absolutely going to test this run defense early on those sides. Keep guys fresh and we'll see who's still fighting come the fourth quarter. Texas was the 19th ranked defense and opponent rush yards per game, and Alabama is getting adjusted to this new offensive style. The pass rush's job is very simple. Keep Milrow contained because he can flip that switch at any time and go for big yards. For the coverage, you've got a lot of speed to keep up with, so don't get burned on the play actions they set up after their runs. Capitalize when Milrow does put the ball in peril. As a defensive coordinator, your first thought is to pressure him and see if he's still antsy in the pocket, but Milrow looks much more improved there even against lower tier competition. The risk with going after him is if you miss, he's out of there for an explosive run. And when you bring 5+, plus, you force your coverage into man. And now you have all your DBs down the field with their backs turned. And when the elusive Milrow sees all that green grass in front of him, he's going to lean on that running ability he's utilized his entire life. With Milrow showing some more composure, sit in zone and make him work through his progressions. Stay on top of that deep number one read and force him to progress through each level of the defense. Drop coverage defenders into windows he's not expecting. Make him be patient and see if he can resist the urge to take off or force a bad throw. Zone will increase the likelihood he tries to force something into our experienced safeties, and it allows us to keep eyes on him if he does decide to take off. When it's time to send pressure, make sure you get home. Your ends better not overrun him, and your interior better stay in their lane or he's going to slip out and hurt you. On key passing downs, clamp down on the easier interior throws that Milrow is most comfortable with. Winning on those key third and fourth downs has been Texas's biggest defensive focus this offseason. And watch out for those big tight ends to be used in the pass game matched up on safeties trying to slip out undetected. But now, let's take a look at the other side of the ball. And spoiler alert, they're talented on that side as well. But before we hit the defense, the sponsor of today's video is PrizePix. PrizePix is a skill-based daily fantasy sports app where you can make college football player projections all season long. How does it work? You select two to six players and choose more or less on their prize pick projections. It could be passing yards, rushing yards, receiving yards, and more. And if those players score more or less than their prize pick projection, you can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. Just hop on the prize picks app or website, go to the college football tab, and check out the player projections. It's a smooth process where you can make your entries in 60 seconds or less with fast withdrawals. It's that easy. As a first-time depositor, use promo code TEXASHOMER and you will receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100. That's double your money up to $100 for your first time. So sign up for prize picks, use promo code TEXASHOMER at sign up and add even more excitement to your game day. Link in the description. The Alabama defense was a top unit overall last year, ranking fourth in the nation in DFEI. But Saban made another change, bringing in Kevin Steele for his third stop in Tuscaloosa. He's been coaching since the 1980s and he knows the ropes. But can he improve them even further? Steele is aggressive, so it'll be interesting to see what pressure packages they utilize. There's a lot of new starters on that side of the ball, but almost all of them have significant reps with the twos or they started at their previous position prior to transferring, and their overall athleticism is actually improved. Remember from last year's preview that the Saban defense is super variable by design. They can run three down and four down fronts, base personnel, or nickel, so don't get too hung up on the positional names. To simplify, I'll break it down to interior defensive line and edge. The interior defensive line at Bama has some question marks depth-wise, but it is a formidable starting group. They're just kind of lacking that true superstar on the inside like they've had in the past. There was an interesting move when Bama released the depth chart. Saban put Jaheim Otis at defensive end instead of nose. He made a ton of noise last year as a true freshman, and he's the most likely to be that big name. But now it's finally the year for him to break out and maximize that 6'5", 320-pound frame. He's that traditional two-gapper that can manhandle centers, stalemating them, and shedding his block to make the tackle and keeping his linebackers clean. But now he's more in that four-eye technique at the end spot. He's strongest in the run, ranking sixth if added to the Big 12. But he's young, so there's still a ton of upside here. 
The reason for the move to defensive end opposed to his obvious nose position was likely because Alabama wanted to find a way for redshirt sophomore Tim Keenan to get on the field. He only played in two games last season, but he's receiving a lot of hype coming out of camp. Having him as a starter opposed to key depth allows for more frontline talent on the field, creating a higher ceiling but likely weakening depth. Then we have Tim Smith backing up Otis at defensive end, a solid, not elite player that has plenty of experience in his senior year with the Tide. He ranks 12th of 28 run-stopping interior defensive linemen. And to round out the interior, we have the other starting defensive end, Justin Eboigby, a redshirt senior, which in Alabama terms is akin to being 100 years old. Eboigby has experience and gotten plenty of snaps, but he has been limited by injury at times. And he's got that Saban schematic flexibility to play as that five technique defensive end or be moved inside based on the situation. He has good get off and he can hold his ground effectively against the run. Overall, he'd be the ninth ranked interior run stopping defensive lineman if added to the Big 12. And now that brings us to the edge, the outside linebackers in the Bama scheme, which has been the pride of the defense, especially when Will Anderson was holding down that jack spot. But Anderson is gone. So what shape is that room in right now? Taking over Anderson's spot is a 6'3", 255-pound senior, Chris Braswell. And while you can't ask someone to be Will Anderson, statistically Braswell has been just as impressive in the pass rush, but with a lesser snap count. The goal is to see if he can sustain that production when he's the main guy and not getting that level of rest he was accustomed to. If added to the Big 12, Braswell is the number one edge pass rusher landing four sacks, five quarterback hits, and 21 hurries in just 183 snaps last year. He can absolutely get after the quarterback as one of the best in the nation on the pass rush. What separates him and Anderson statistically is their ability in the run game. Anderson was the top pass rusher if added to the Big 12 and the second best run stopping edge. Once we exclude the guys that graduated like Anderson, Braswell is now the top pass rusher if added to the Big 12, but he's the 16th ranked run stopping edge of 28 players. So that's the key difference between an Anderson and a Braswell. Anderson was a much more well rounded player. The edge opposite Braswell is Sam linebacker Dallas Turner. Turner's a beast in the pass rush as well, ranking third if added to the Big 12. Notching five sacks, six quarterback hits, and 28 hurries on 312 pass rush attempts in 2022. And he is more balanced, ranking as the sixth best edge run stopper if added to the Big 12. Are either one of them Will Anderson? No. But that's why Will Anderson was so special, being dominant over multiple seasons at both the pass and the run. Now let's take a look at the inside linebackers where I think they upgraded athletically compared to last year's starters. Bama has new starters at both spots. First up at will is Deontay Lawson taking over Toa Toa's role calling the defense. Lawson had a ton of reps last season and he started the last two games so he's no newbie. The key for him this offseason was becoming a vocal leader and all sources indicate he's made that leap. Lawson is the first graded linebacker if added to the Big 12 but it's yet to be seen how effective he is manning the line and getting them into the right looks as the season unfolds. At Mike, we have the other new starter in Georgia transfer Tresman Marshall. The redshirt senior suffered an injury at Georgia, and with that linebacker group, if you missed reps, you got passed up on the depth chart. So Marshall made the decision to head to Bama where there was more opportunity for him to get a starting gig. Even in his limited backup role last year at Georgia with only 170 snaps, he did good work. He'd rank as the 7th best overall linebacker if added to the Big 12. And then finally, we have the secondary. And they did a great job last year, only allowing 5.7 yards per pass attempt for 3rd in the nation. Corner 1 is a lock with the 6'1", 195-pound Kool-Aid McKinstry. We wanted to see him grow in his second year last season, and he did just that. He's athletic, he's physical, and he's got that intensity to lock dudes up. He's graded as the third coverage corner if added to the Big 12, only allowing 46% of balls to be completed against him. And a lot of those are quick throws where he's giving up space by schematic design. He also likes to come down in the run game and make the tackle, so he's not purely a finesse guy. He tacks on another season of strong performances, and he's locked up that early round draft pick. The corner opposite him is sophomore Terry and Arnold, and he was in a similar situation as Kool-Aid in his first year. 
His athleticism flashed, able to go step for step with Evan Stewart, and did a good job against Worthy. But as a young guy, of course, there were some mistakes. I'd expect Arnold to make a big jump in his second year starting. He's currently ranked as the eighth coverage corner if added to the Big 12. But Saban didn't make it easy on Arnold, bringing in Trey Amos from Louisiana. He wasn't some highly rated recruit, but a senior that developed over his first three years at the G5 level and has NFL traits. Right now, he's that third corner, but he's still going to get a ton of snaps, and if Arnold struggles, he can take that starting spot. Safety has two new starters as well. Let's start with strong safety. Caleb Downs is a special, special talent. Like Pro Bowl NFL talent, purely based on his athleticism from his high school tape. He has insane range, ability to traverse the field in the blink of an eye, and even if he does make the wrong read, he can recover instantly. I can't stress enough how special I think this kid is going to be for years to come. But ultimately, he is a first-year starter, and Saban's coverages are complex. I'm fascinated to watch this kid and how Sark tries to test his knowledge early on and how his athleticism can make him right even when he's wrong. Even though he's a strong safety, I like playing him more up high as that midfielder and allowing that ability and instinct to take over. Don't overload him with information too early and slow him down. Then Bama has another new starting free safety in UAB transfer Jalen Key. And he suffered an injury in game one, but as of writing this video, I have to assume he's still going to get the start. He's a big, lanky dude at 6'2", 210 pounds, and he still has the frame to add size even though he's a grad transfer. His straight-line athleticism flashes on tape, but I do like him more in that box safety role due to his closing speed tracking ball carriers or on shallow routes. He's got that mix of safety and linebacker traits that'll translate well to that context, so I was surprised to see he wasn't the listed strong safety on the depth chart. I do think he's stronger coming downhill than moving backwards, and I'd be weary matching him up man-to-man -man on vertical stuff with the receivers. But due to the athleticism for his size, there's no reason he couldn't be a too-high safety able to cap routes on half of the field at times. I like this addition, and personally just a player I want to see push to his max against steady Power 5 competition because he's got more upside to tap. And another player that went down with injury in Game 1 is starting nickel Malachi Moore. He was a middle-of-the-pack coverage defender last season, ranking 38th of 75 coverage DBs. But he did struggle against the run, ranking 55th of 75 run-stopping DBs if added to the Big 12. He should improve as the starter in that nickel role replacing Brian Branch, and he does do a good job on the pass rush coming from the slot. For the Texas offensive keys, first game one I wasn't impressed overall. They caught on in the second half, but that was a very average performance given the third year in the system and the talent on the depth chart. In the run, of course, we have to do a way better job than we did last year. Bama absolutely shut down our run game, and we had a top 10 pick at running back. But that was only game two with a young line. We returned all five starters, even though DJ Campbell did beat out Hudson for the start. But there's added experience and familiarity with this group, even though they sure didn't look like it in game one. We have a new group of running backs looking to make a name, but it's on the offensive line to step up and get that push against a traditionally elite rushing defense. In the past, Banks and Jones will be tasked with handling Braswell and Turner. Anderson was held in check for the most part, but Turner made the play of the game, knocking Quinn out with injury. The interior is where my nerves lie. They struggled coordinating effectively in pass protection, and Saban's system is excellent at deploying their linebackers in the pass rush. We have a lot to fix in one week because Rice exploited our lack of preparedness there. Quinn ended up on the ground far too much, and Ewers tends to get shaky when he's not clean in the pocket. No more silly penalties or pass pro busts when Saban starts running his blitz games. The other major key is to test the new safeties. They're both talented, but Sark has a special way of making defenses break their rules and bust coverages. On top of the schematic ability of Sark, we have way more than just worthy to test you. A veteran Jordan Whittington returns, JT Sanders in his contract year, and we added Georgia's Adonai Mitchell. Then you've got Nayer, Cook, and Moore all ready to make a splash on top of that. On paper, this is a top receiving core in the country, but now's the time to prove that. Texas surprised Bama last year, but no one is taking this game lightly this season. Alabama wants to return to former glory after missing the playoffs altogether, and Texas is looking to make a statement after 12 years of wandering in the desert. 
The talent and the motivation is there for both teams. The only thing left to do is go out on the field and see who wants it more. Thanks for hanging out. Watch some more of my videos here. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and share if you want to support Quality Texas content. As always, hook on.